My name is Brian Bloomhagen. Uh, I'm the general manager of a general contracting company based in Iowa Falls called New Modern Concepts. And uh, we, like our presenters here, all operate in the, this uh, hog industry doing new construction, remodels, and maintenance of existing facilities. So uh, I'm based in Iowa Falls, and I'll be the moderator today. Our first speaker uh, is John Bolin. He uh, is with Hogslat. He is originally from uh, northeast Iowa, from those youth up there, uh, the town of Elgin. He grew up participating in agriculture and livestock operations of friends and relatives and doing construction work with his father. John got his start in ag construction in the summer of 1991 while he was attending Iowa State University. In the summer, he worked uh, in, in the concrete work and some qu equipment installation and uh, doing one of the first slat uh, installed in a uh, finisher in northeast Iowa. Uh, for a neighbor of his. After graduating from Iowa State in the fall of 1992 with a business degree, he was employed as a foreman on a concrete crew that was doing some subcontract work for Hogslat, and that's what led to um, the job offer to become a construction supervisor in 1994. Um, he's been with Hogslap for 25 years and has performed many jobs, including job supervisor, construction, estimating and purchasing, service tech, service department manager, retail sales representative, and is currently a turn, uh, turnkey, um, excuse me, currently an outside salesman uh, since 2016. He lives in Humboldt um, and uh, is married with his wife, Deanna, and children, Kelly and Aaron. So with that, I think John's going to start us off, and he's going to touch on um, slats and gating and, I think, feeders, um, and then we'll introduce our next speaker after that. But again, if you have questions, um, try to write that down and remember that, and we'll ask them all at the end, all right? So let's welcome John up. Well, thanks for attending today. Um, we've got a lot of material to cover, and we're going to try to fly through it pretty fast so we can give uh, ample time to everybody. So um, between that and the state of my voice, I'm going to try to be kind of brief on everything. So uh, save some questions for the end, and we'll try to cover it if you are um, still, still have questions when you get to the end. So we're going to start out with slat repair and maintenance. Um, you know, slats are one of the most expensive parts of the building as far as uh, you don't, you know, the state of Iowa considers it part of the structure, but, you know, it's really in there performing a job. It's holding everything up. It's a performing piece of equipment of the barn. It takes maintenance, takes repairs, uh, and it has a lifespan. So you want to be um, diligent about your selection of the slats you put in. You want to keep a close look on them, and you want to keep them in a good state of uh, repair to maximize your life. Um, the way that you want to do that is uh, you want to start an inspection process. So maybe, you know, starting after the first couple of years that you've got your barn there, you want to start that inspection process and you want to look at uh, the slats and beams each time the building is emptied, cleaned in between groups, and then come up with a annual inspection for your slats and beams um, if it starts to look like they're uh, um, starting to have some wear. Um, you can also get some assistance for this in the industry because there's several different uh, companies out there that specialize in replacing slats, and they're very good at coming in, taking a look at your existing slats that you have, and giving you an evaluation on their condition. And they can tell you approximately, you know, if you've got quite a bit of life left in them, or if it's something critical that you need to address quickly. The first thing that you're going to see on your slats um, is you're going to see surface damage on them. And that's basically caused from a reaction of urine, manure, water, and feed additives, mainly salt, it gets mixed. You're going to see it mostly around your feeders. And it starts eating the Portland cement that makes up the, the slat. And if you don't do something to slow down this corrosion or retreat the surface of the slat, that's going to... Uh, cause your slat to have premature failure. So we're going to look at basically three levels of damage on a slat, level one, two, and three. Um, the first level of damage would be an area around feeders or waters. Um, you could have a brand new building and you'll start to see 
some deterioration in these areas right after your first turn. Uh, so it doesn't take long, and that's normal. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, just because your slats are starting to wear a little bit doesn't mean that they weren't made correctly. It doesn't mean that they're um, an inferior product. Um, that's just the normal chemical reaction that happens. To prevent the uh, some of that surface damage from getting further uh, into the slat and causing more structural damage on new slats and light wear, um, typically into the industry, you'll do it a couple of ways. Uh, one is with a plastic mat. You'll want to cover the area around the feeders or the waters with a plastic mat to keep the uh, water and the chemicals from get, getting at the top of the slat. Um, another product that's in the industry that's been used quite a bit is a um, Armor Rock epoxy that you can either use with or without sand to do some coating. Some level two damage is going to be a little more than just surface area. You're going to see um, exposed aggregate. You're going to see bigger chunks of uh, concrete missing. And you're going to have quite a bit more rough surface. And you could lead to some um, animal health, pig health issues um, if you get to this condition. Um, a good way to repair that kind of damage is to use a patching product. Um, there's some less expensive vinyl patches out there that you can use. And um, then there's some higher end products like Conquerite that are a patch that's not based on Portland cement and is a little more resistant to wear. Um, Portland cement reacts quickly with uh, urine, salt, manure, and uh, this other cement, uh, although it is Portland based, it's got a few different characteristics in it. Um, it won't actually react with it, so it'll actually be harder and last longer than the slat underneath it. If you get to some level three damage, you're looking at some pretty severe wear. Um, this would be a good time to bring that contractor in to take a look at it and try to determine, can I patch this and get any additional life out of it, or is it time to look at replacing? This could include some mechanical braking on some edges, um, and there you've got a you know an animal welfare issue if they actually put their foot down through that. They're going to rub the sides of their feet raw, or they'll get stuck. Um, you can repair level three damage with a mixture of either the armor coat epoxy or with a, a concrete patch. You want to do all that because this is what you don't want to have happen in your barn. So this is what happens when you don't take a look at it, keep up on it. You're going to walk in one day and you're going to find a similar situation to this. And the last question that everybody asks themselves is, who makes that last pig in that pen jump in the pit with the rest of them, right? <laughs> you got a whole pig, of, pig pen full of pigs. Some of them fall in, and when you get in there, there isn't a single one of them in there. They all jumped in. So I don't know who pushed the last one in, but they're always all in there. So what you're going to look at is on your slat beams, if you go around your building and you uh, determine that 40% of your slat beams are failing, that's a good time to start thinking about uh, when the complete slat replacement costs. Um, is better than just trying to keep patching. So identifying slat beam failure, you're going to be looking across the edges and the top, and you're going to start seeing cracks. Now the cracks are caused because water has gotten into the slat, and the rebar that's in there has started to corrode uh, and rust, and that causes it to expand, and that cracks the concrete. And then more water gets in, you get more rust, cracks the concrete. So when you get to the point where the rebar is going to fail, that's where you see a failure in the slat. Um, it's very hard to get at damage on the side of this slat. So if you're seeing that, you're a, a candidate for slat replacement. Um, some surface cracks on the top like this, they're not quite as critical. You can patch those pretty easily and stay ahead of them and uh, shouldn't be that much of a problem as far as structural um, integrity of the beams. 
just a couple more pictures here of that. So the support beams underneath. Many times you'll have slats fall in, not because there's anything wrong with the slats, but because the lintels underneath them have failed. So you want to look down between your slats and see if you've got cracking on the sides or the ends where they sit on the pillars. If you've got um, beams in there where there's chunks of concrete missing from the bottom side, that's a very bad sign. And this is a couple of pictures of what they look like, you know, in the barn. So if you've got that kind of conditions in your barn, you're going to want to try to get it addressed quickly, um, or you'll be looking at a pretty expensive price tag to dig a lot of stuff out of the pit and fix it after it's fallen in. You can inspect the support beams by looking sideways through the cracks of your slats and see where you're seeing some structural failure on the beams. So the slat is in good condition in this picture, but the beam is not. And there's kind of a close-up. You can kind of see some cracks. Um, I don't know if this has a laser pointer or not. But uh, you can see some cracks in the underlying beam. A lot of failures that you'll experience or see in your barns are caused from the construction of the barn. A lot of times the columns will get off a little bit, and uh, when they try to set everything in place, stuff doesn't line up. And you'll get a condition like this where the beam just catches the very edge of a slat, or excuse me, of a column. And uh, it'll sit there over time, but um, after 10, 15 years, it'll actually shear that edge of that column off, and that uh, beam will sag down. Here's another condition that we commonly see out there is uh, beams coming out of pockets on the end of the barns. Excuse me. Several years ago when it was really dry, probably 2011 or 2012, um, I got several calls on uh, somebody saying, hey, I'm starting to see slats sag down on the end of my barn. And what had happened was the ground outside of the building had dried out so much had shrunk away from the pit and the pit wall being full of manure had actually pushed out a little bit and it pushed out enough to let the beam fall out of the end pocket. If you see an uneven condition starting to appear in your barn uh, that wasn't there before that's probably indicating some uh, movement underneath and you need to address it. So when you look at replacing your slats, um, what are some questions you want to ask? So you want to ask, do I want flat top slats, um, hand finished versus machine finished, dry cast slats, and how is the rebar put inside? Here's a, some pictures of a uh, top of slats. If you do a machine finished slat, you get a more consistent surface. Dry cast, so in the process of making a slat, the less amount of water that you can put in the concrete to activate it, the better. And uh, the reason is, is because when the concrete dries, that water leaves the, leaves the actual slat. And it leaves behind voids in the slat. So if you can mix the concrete up with less water, there's less voids in there that appear after the slat is cured and there's fewer voids in the slat for moisture to get into it. And you want to get a slat that's got welded wire mats and uh, I know hog slat uses a uh, plastic piece that goes in every mold that's actually inside the slat that holds the rebar in the exact correct spot in every beam so that it's Every slat from the one that we made in July to one that we made in September, it always has the rebar in exactly the same spot. Um, so replacement cost, um, I checked with a couple of contractors on this to find out. And worst case scenario, to change out slats and beams on a 1,200 head barn, um, you're looking at about $40,000 of labor and the slats, lintels, and the trucking to get them there is about 45000 So 
it's about eighty five eighty to eighty five thousand dollars on the twelve hundred head barn. So you know approximately one hundred and sixty to one hundred and seventy thousand dollars on a twenty four hundred head finisher. So it's well worth your investment to put a little time in ahead of time and um, make sure you're staying up on your repair and your maintenance and also evaluate um, the slats that are available to you, you know, your opportunity cost of uh, making sure you got uh, the best slat that you can afford when you put it in. Um, another five or $6,000 up front, you know, might stave off that one hundred and sixty to one hundred seventy thousand dollars in repairs for another six, seven, eight years. So, all right. The other thing that I'm going to be talking about this morning is gating and feeding equipment. All right. So, gating and feeding equipment. Um, you want to adapt ad adapting your gate design and layout to maximize your strength and durability to changing building designs and animal weights. So, when you're laying everything out, you want to make sure you've got the correct pen size for um, the uh, um, for the amount of animals you're going to have in there, you want to select your feeders um, based on some of it on your feed type and your animal market weights. Um, when this industry first got started going to confinements, you know, in the early 90s, 40 wide barn was pretty standard. You had 25 to 30 head pens, and a target market weight of an animal was 240 pounds, and so you could get away with making longer gate panels and using smaller feet to hold everything up because the animals didn't beat it up and you had smaller pen sizes. And that worked well for the industry for several years. Starting around 2000, 2001, somewhere in there, we started going to 50, 60, 70, and 80 wide barns. Uh, we had larger groups. And uh, then we also had additional weight gain on the pigs. You know, now a 280, 290 pound animal is considered small you know sometimes they're even up to 320 so gating designs and layouts that were designed to hold 240 pound animals they didn't fare very well uh, if you used the same parameters um, so it, it presented some challenges to making sure that we were keeping up our gating design for how we were actually using the building so that's a picture of a standard bolt on foot that we used to use Still works good in nurseries, still has some good applications on it, but um, I wouldn't use a lot of these in a current you know, building design. Um, stainless steel foot, you can see where this foot is bolted on, um, pretty much transmits all of the torsion and side forces right into the bottom um, angle on the gate. So, you know, current designs now for gating include um, heavier duty posts, uh, heavier duty plates, thicker materials. Um, so a flat bar post is pretty standard in the industry today and you want to get one that's got a foot long enough that you can get two fasteners, one on each side. That's also going to increase the longevity of your slats. Here's another picture of a flat bar post. Um, the flat bar post is a full length um, piece of iron that goes all the way up to the top of the gate and it, it limits the deflection of the panels with the gussets and the fasteners. So if you get a bunch of pigs pushing on it, it supports the gate and the structure around it and um, it, it helps maintain the integrity of your welds. A couple of pictures of some st um, different bolt-on feet here. Um, the stainless steel foot on the left works pretty good uh, except that you know, you're basically carrying all of the torsion forces on the bottom six inches on the gate. Here's a picture of a, what you would use at an aisle. Again, you got two fasteners and some gussets to help distribute the forces all the way up the panel and just not at the bottom of the gate. Um, a common design now is to have a quick loadout or a sort pen. And so you need a pretty heavy duty post to accommodate all the swing panels uh, and quick alley stuff that you go in there. So you, you need to have a half inch base plates, um, additional gussets, um, so that that will perform well over time. And here's another picture of a, a post that you would use at an alley that doesn't have another gate hooked up to it. And you want to make sure that you can get four fasteners in the bottom of that to hold it structurally. So 
what I think are the keys to maximizing your penning longevity is to keep up with your deteriorating posts and feet and weld and repair at every turn of pigs. Um, when you're replacing gating, you might not want to put it back in exactly the same way it came out. Evaluate your design and uh, get some more flat bar posts in there and shorten up your panel lengths. If you start getting over eight to nine feet on your panel lengths, then shorten the panel length, put a flat bar post in, and everything will perform a lot better for you uh, over the course of time. Um, new construction, um, the same, same parameters. Try to keep your gate lengths shorter. Um, investigate the increased cost to use galvanized finishes or stainless steel materials. Anything you can do to, um, you know, increase that length of that life of that mild steel will translate into a longer life. And then also look at thicker materials um, in areas where you're going to have heavier pig contact. Um, just going to jump right into the feeder design. Feeder design and sizing, we have uh, two major types of feeders in the industry today. We have dry feeders and wet dry feeders. Here's an example of a standard box dry feeder. Um, the industry started out with um, using uh, 12 inches usually as the width of a pig to stand there and eat. As we've gotten bigger, you're going to see those dividers move out to around 15 inches. So um, if you've got an integrator that's um, taking their animals up to 280, 300, 320, you're going to want to look at having um, additional width of your feeding stall sizes on the edge of your feeder. Um, this is an example of a wet dry shelf feeder. Um, it's got 15 inch wide feeding stations. Um, uh, wet dry feeders are a real good idea if you're using pelleted feed. Pigs are good at when they're feeding at blowing the fines with their nose and uh, eating the pellets. And uh, this is a good way to utilize capturing those fines back where you don't have to just go clean the fines out of your feeder every day because the pigs won't eat them. The fines will fall down, mix with the water, and they'll, in, uh, they'll intake it with the water, uh, and it works real well that way. Um, if you've got a larger pen design and you need to get the required amount of feeder space, sometimes it's better to choose, use two smaller feeders than to use one big one. You know, a 72-inch, 80, 90-inch feeder gets a little unwieldy to move around the pen. So consider going with uh, two smaller feeders. The thing I think I see the most with feeders is um, the pigs push on them and beat them up like no other piece of equipment in the barn. So if they're not fast and secure to the floor and they can start working something, that's going to translate into a crack uh, or a tear in the stainless steel. And it's going to result in a lot of repairs and shortened feeder life. So make sure they're fastened good to the floor. Here's an example of a, I think that's an Amera feeder, I'm not sure, um, used in a large sort pin design. It's got some heavy duty posts on both sides of it, as well as the flange on the end of it. And, uh, you know, I would put a fastener just about everywhere I could to hold that down, maximize the strength um, so the pigs can't move it. So keys to maximizing your feeder life and your performance. So you want to size your feeder correctly for the pigs um, that you have in a pen, especially with wet dry feeders. Um, if you don't get enough feed flowing through those, they will gum, gum up on you. And you'll start getting wet, stale, moldy feed in the corners. Um, you want to use stainless steel materials in the 300 series steel if possible. Do your roommate, routine maintenance on them in between turns of pigs. And um, I'm going to show you this next uh, slide. And you want to become an, edu an educated customer because you want to know what you're purchasing. So this scale right here is what's called a Pren scale, pitting resistance equivalency number. And what it does is it compares um, different materials uh, on a sliding scale and how resistant they are to corrosion. So 304 series stainless steel falls out on this scale on an 18. And it's 304 stainless steel is a composition of chromium and nickel. Uh, it's easily welded. Um, 
but it's the most expensive, but that's pretty much the standard that we've used in the industry. Um, back in the mid-2000s when stainless, 304 stainless went off the chart, the industry had to figure out a way to make feeders without spending $800 a feeder when they had been spending $300 a feeder. And so we started using some 400 series stainless steel. And uh, 439 is the best stainless steel in the 400 series. If you're going to go down to the 400 series, is the best one to use. It only drops down the print scale by a, a count of one. Um, and there's basically no nickel in it, so it's basically made out of all chromium. Uh, it's also easily weldable and doesn't get hardened when it welds. Um, the steels that you would want to avoid are 419 or 429 because they've got a high carbon content to them and uh, they don't weld well. So if somebody's selling you a feeder and it's 429 and it's welded, you want to check into that. I wouldn't purchase it because it's going to hydrogen crack over time. So just become an educated consumer, ask those questions to those people that are supplying you materials and um, just know what you're buying. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, John. I know you had to battle through a cold today. So uh, our next speaker is Matt Cunningham. Matt is the founding partner of Premier Ag Systems, LLC, with offices in Elkader and Alden, Iowa. The business was started in January of 2015 by Matt and his partner, Dean Franzen. Uh, growing up in northeast Iowa, Matt's love for pigs and swine management began at an early age. He enjoyed riding uh, with his dad as a retired veterinarian on farm calls. Matt worked for hog producers during his high school years and continued his education at Ellsworth Community College. He graduated from the swine confinement program. In the next 12 years, he managed and supervised sow units uh, for three large companies. Matt then started to focus on construction and equipment installation side of the hog uh, confinements. He worked for two large equipment and construction companies for 10 years before returning to Northeast Iowa and uh, forming Premier Ag Systems. Uh, Premier Ag Systems is a general contractor building turnkey swine and chicken facilities, remodeling existing facilities, and repairing installed equipment. Premier Ag works with many large suppliers in the swine industry. Premier Ag is a full service contractor from the ground up to the placement of animals. Uh, and Matt's going to focus on the feeding and ventilation systems uh, portion of it here. So, so I'm going to focus on feed and ventilation systems here for a short period this afternoon. I'm going to start with the feed systems portion of it. And we'll just start from the, the outside of the building, work our way in. So when it comes to the bulk bins, you should routinely inspect the function of the feed lid to prevent rain or blowing snow to enter. The bulk then cause moldy, moldy feed and rusting on the interior of the tank. We we see this sometimes where lids have been damaged by feed, you know, the feed truck drivers or whatnot, and um, don't they don't close properly, which leads to moisture being in the tank and feed systems plugging up or or the bulk bins rusting from the the inside out. Uh, it's also a good idea to routinely inspect the ladders for safe operation and tighten any loose or missing bolts. Um, that, that goes in with the leg bracing as well. Um, sometimes the, you know, the, I've seen loose bolts around the unloaders or the, the boots on the bends just from the feed system's vibration over time. So it's a good idea to just routinely inspect these items. Um, you also want to routinely inspect the unloaders, uh, open the doors on the unloaders, clean, clean any old or moldy feed out of them if what feed is present. And, and then you're also going to also want to figure out where that moisture's getting into the, the unloader because there, there shouldn't be any moisture in them if everything's working properly. Um, inspecting the, uh, some more inspection points when it comes to the feed systems. Um, it's also, you know, a really good idea between groups of pigs, and I, I own a pig barn myself, so in between every every turn, I try and do all these practices to uh, catch things before they become big problems. So inspect the feed pipes between groups, tighten or replace any missing chains, hooks, etc., and that's, this will prevent the auger or the pipe from drooping and creating the auger to wear through the pipe over time. Um, 
you know, we've all seen it outside where the all the sweeps where the feeds entering into the building going through the elbows or the sweeps they become cracked or damaged or worn through um, instead of duct taping them together just uh, stay stay current and and uh, get those those sweeps replaced inspect the chains on the outside of the building where the the chains are supporting the feed pipes um, going into the building I've seen a lot of times where they're not um, either you know, the chains or, or whatever the support system is, is has failed or just um, become damaged over time. And then that will allow that. What, what happens is the feed pipe then will, where it comes out of the unloader on the stub tube, it will put a lot of extra pressure on that stub tube and the, the welds will break away and then your unloader is damaged. So um, staying current with that is very important. I um, also want to inspect the feed tubes and drop tubes um, and loosen, loosen them to prevent them from falling off and dumping feed into the pit. So I'm sure, I don't, hopefully you've never had this happen, but if something vibrates loose and the, the feed drop is, you know, a pig gets up in the feeder, gets it knocked off, or they become loose and their system starts up and you go into the morning, go into do chores the next morning and find that your bend's out of feed and all of it's laying in the pit. Um, that's that's not a good position to be in. Um, and also inspect the feed drop ropes and replace them if uh, you know if they're showing signs of wear. With the motors in their gearboxes, this doesn't happen very often. But uh, again. These, these little practices will help things last a lot longer in your barns. Uh, check the oil levels in the gearboxes and refill them to the correct level. Uh, that, that doesn't maybe necessarily need to be done between every group of pigs, but I would for sure try to do that at least annually. Inspect the wires in the control unit boxes and make sure they're tight and not corroding, causing something to short out or burn a, burn a control unit out or something like that. Um, one a, a common problem too is sometimes in the smart IRs or the halos or whatever you're using for um, a device to control the feed system, there'll be excess buildup of dust will get up inside those and make them less sensitive. So routinely you should you know try and stick a towel up in there or something and, and wipe those those the lenses off to keep those working properly. Inspect and clean out any de any debris inside the unloaders, and then when power washing, try not to, you know, directly blast the motors and the control units, uh, smart irons or halos or anything like that. They're waterproof to a point, but nothing can, you know, withstand a 3,000-pound blast of water directly at it. Um, monthly things that you should do on your feed systems would include greasing the anchor bearings on both the exterior and interior of the buildings on your flag lines. <clears throat> Inspect the switches for the control units and power units for signs of moisture and replace them if needed. Um, check the settings on your, your smart IRs or halos and adjust the max run and delay times. Longer delay times um, before the feeders are empty will help prevent short cycling on the, the feed system where it's just turning on, off, on, off, on, off all day. That's really hard on the motors and the auger. So you want to figure out how much feed your feeders hold. Try and figure out, um, you know, how long it takes market weight pigs to drain those feeders and have those systems turn on and off. So the feeders don't run out, but you're not kicking your system on and on and off. Um, too many times. When it comes to the ventilation systems, <clears throat> try not to run variable fans much below 40 percent. This doesn't really apply to the new smart fans that are out on the market, but uh, the, the fan motors are cooled by air being pulled over them, and if the louvers on pit fans are dirty or any any fan if the louvers are dirty and they don't allow the louver to open and the fans running too slow the the motor won't be cooled and it, it uh, can lead to premature motor failure uh, clean the pit fans between groups this 
you know, seldomly happens, and I'm just as guilty of it probably on my own barn sometimes. But uh, try to try to clean them out between groups. This will help keep the louvers cleaner, help with the fan efficiencies and, and longevity of the pit fans. Uh, clean the wall fan louvers, props, and housings routinely to increase the efficiency and longevity of the fan motors and the fan, um, just the overall fan health. Check fan housing and cones for damage from snow or lawn mowers and fix if damaged. You know, we routinely see in the winter months if there's a big snow bank pushing up against uh, some fans or covering the pit fans if, there, if there's drifting issues. Just just be cognizant of that and and because uh, all that additional weight of the snow and and whatnot can can damage the, the fan cones and housings. Inspect the fan belts for excessive wear and replace them. If the belt is recessed into the pulleys down, you know, if it, it's really below the top of the pulley, this will really decrease the fan efficiency. So um, you don't you don't want to see your, your belts recessed into the pulleys too far or you're, or you're hurting your fan efficiency. Inspect the pulleys on the fans for cracks or breakage. Um, you're also going to want to inspect the bearings, the tensioners, springs, and shafts and replace them if broken or loose. After power washing, it's, I, I kind of left this out on the feed system portion of it, but after you power wash your barn, you should go through and grease all your bearings, your anchor bearings, pulleys on fans, pulleys on your inlet systems and whatnot, and um, try and push the water that might have gotten into the, might have gotten um, blown into the bearing. This will help keep your bearings um, from, from seizing up and, and extend the life of them greatly. And then also, <clears throat> in the times where after power washing, just grease all the bearings at least every two months when they're being used. Uh, when it comes to the curtain and the inlet machines, you're going it's you should grease the drive block, the drive screw, and the bearings inside the machines uh, at least every every couple of months. Uh, grease all your curtain and inlet pulleys every every two months if you can. Uh, while you're doing that, you want to inspect your hand winches, cables, lift ropes, and replace them and tighten cable clamps if they've worked loose. It's also a good idea to inspect all mounting hardware for hand winches and pulley brackets and tighten them if they're loose or broken. Ensure that lift ropes or cables are able to move freely over the pulleys and are not binding or, or um, catching because that'll cause excessive wear and uh, the ropes or, or cables will break. Between groups of pigs, uh, in, in inspection of the inlet doors is, is a very good practice. Run the inlets close and tighten and adjust inlet doors. Inspect cable clamps, ropes, and springs. Uh, if you're using counterweighted inlets, um, adjusting those seasonally with, uh, with, with the different weather conditions is a good management practice. During the winter months, break up any ice buildup daily that may occur on inlet doors. It always seems like there's a couple, couple of days out of each winter where the conditions are just right, and sometimes you'll see your inlet doors ice up and, and freeze. So when you're doing chores, it's, it's good to um, pay careful attention to that. Inspect the snow doors, pulleys, cable clamps, hooks, etc., for smooth operation. Inspect your soffit from dirt or, de or debris buildup and clean if necessary to ensure adequate airflow into the attic. Uh, this is really, really good practice to get into in the summer. Uh, during the summer months, run the curtains up to a closed position weekly. This will keep the rodents from bur burrowing into the curtains themselves and chewing holes in them. And if there's any excess water buildup from a rain event or something like that, you can, um, that'll drain all the water out of the curtains and prevent them from leading, or prevent them from growing mildew. Inspect 
wind ropes, belting, and curtain straps for wear or breakage. Uh, the bird wire also, you should inspect bird wire and ensure that cable clamps haven't caught the bird wire when they're traveling up and down and have torn holes in the, the, the bird wire itself. If curtain has holes, either patch or replace curtain to prevent heat loss or cold spots around those openings. And inspect the curtain pipe and if separation has occurred between pieces of pipe, it's a good idea to get those, those uh, reattached. And inspect curtain stitching. On the heaters and the backup thermostats, <clears throat> between groups, run the heaters to blow out any water from washing and drying uh, from, from the power washing. And by running the heater after you've power washed, it'll help dry the components of the, the inside of the heater out and, and um, help extend the life of the heater. Uh, before winter, it's, it's um, good to take an air compressor into the barn and blow out any dust and debris inside of the heaters um, versus washing the inside of the heaters out. Run the heaters, listen and watch the squirrel cage fan for smooth, for smooth operation. If you hear excessive noise or, or wobble, it's a good idea to replace those before the winter months start. Ensure that there is a proper flame on the pilot heaters and if the flame is weak, uh, clean, clean or replace the, the heater orifice. Uh, inspect the gas lines where they enter the building for rusting, for rusting or leakage. This is a common place for gas line failure due to the uh, moisture because of the thermal transfer at the wall location. And after power washing, clean the coils of the backup thermostats out to keep them from rusting and uh, ensure better accuracy. Um, our third speaker this afternoon uh, is Justin Horsowski. Uh, he grew up in southeast Iowa where he resides with his wife, uh, Natalie, and two kids, Sydney, three, and Cohen, one. He has been working for Precision Structures, Inc. for uh, six years, and in that time he has worked with many producers on their facility needs and everything from sow production to finishing. Justin enjoys spending his free time uh, with his family and being outdoors, and Justin's going to focus on the structure uh, in his portion of the talk, so please give a round of applause for Justin. Okay, well thank you, um, and thanks for having me again. Um, so I'm with Precision Structures, I'm a, a salesman currently. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on the structure, maintenance, and longevity. Um, when I think about the structure, um, there's a few main pieces that we, we think about um, that maybe require a little more maintenance or what we see more maintenance of over, over time. Um, one thing, you know, that comes to mind initially is, you know, attic and attic inspections, and I think that's one thing that's important and valuable. I think people don't necessarily do it enough, but it's all, always important to, you know, get up in the attic maybe once a year if you can and just to see how everything's looking. Um, so some of the things that you may see in your attic um, would be, you know, roof and the rusting of steel. And with the corrosive environment of the facilities, that's something that can happen and generally does happen over a number of years. Um, pinholes, you know, in the roof from the underside. Typically, a lot of the times where those start would be um, on the top side of the purlins and um, at the bottom of the roof, you know, above the open soffit. And so, but just inspecting uh, for those um, and fixing those um, is valuable um, just to prevent, you know, getting moisture in the attic, getting water in the attic, some of those things that if you let go too long can cause more problems than just steel issues. Um, also, rusted or compromised, you know, truss plates, um, you know, just viewing the truss plates making sure that they are still there and they are still doing what they're supposed to be doing which is holding those trusses together is valuable so you don't have um, some type of an issue with you know truss falling apart or something like that um, one way to spot leaks would be you know water stains on lumber so one thing to look for in your attic space would just be you know staining stuff like that um, any other you know compromised fasteners um, anything like that just to to make sure that there's none of that that needs fixed or repaired. Um, and then insulation uh, settlement. And, you know, one thing that this can also indicate, you know, 
wintertime attic inspection can be uh, helpful just to make sure that you're not getting a bunch of snow, like a snow drift in your attic that can cause other issues as well, but making sure that your insulation is proper um, will also help your facility management and your, your heat and all that stuff as well. So, um, and then your insulation stops be my last one here. That ties into what Matt was talking about for ventilation, but making sure that, um, again, it's holding the insulation in place, but it's also not blocking the airflow into the attic. Um, tips for helping create longevity with your roof steel. So again, with the corrosive environment, um, there doesn't seem to be the perfect option of a roof that does not rust and we still generally use with the building package, um, you know, 29 gauge G90 or G100 steel is the most common and uh, that seems to be an in industry wide. Um, so as far as your sites in general, making sure that, you know, you have optimal airflow on your site. You know, we often see if a, if a building is built um, in a lower portion of land where there's less airflow, uh, a lot of times there tends to be more corrosion and more stagnant air. Um, the other thing that we see is, you know, trees can be nice around facilities um, and pleasing to the eye, but if you have trees too close to a building and it is completely surrounded, that also blocks the airflow. So that's something that we see. Um, preventing that will help your building last longer. Um, and then also uh, optimal ventilation inside the barn. You know, um, I think these guys touched on it earlier, 40 wides, you know, 20 years ago was, was more common and naturally ventilated was more common now with uh, tunnel ventilation we see uh, the buildings lasting uh, much longer just because you're getting that airflow more consistently through the barn. Um, as far as the roof steel goes and the underside of the steel, you know, a few things that we've tried um, would be like additional vapor barrier. Typically there is a vapor barrier above your open soffit and that's just designed to prevent that moisture, especially in the wintertime ventilation from settling right on the bottom side of the steel. Um, we can actually do that vapor barrier the whole way up the roof, you know, the whole line. Um, we also use a product called Drip Stop that uh, they put on the underside of the steel. One of the benefits of Drip Stop is it's, it uh, eliminates um, any opportunity for basically a vapor space between the steel and the Drip Stop because it adheres to the bottom of the steel completely. Um, but it doesn't completely eliminate rusting. Um, the other alternative or, or option, and it's more common on nursery buildings, would be like an insulation, you know, um, just a two inch fiberglass insulation between the purlins and the rough steel. But all of those things are going to help the steel last longer on your roof. Um, the other thing uh, just to consider with your building would be, you know, the soffit openings. And that's a lot of the reason that, that lets a lot of moisture into the attic. And so, um, essentially, you know, ventilation is very important for the pigs and very important for facility design and that usually dictates what type of soffit is used, but soffit can also um, be used to help protect that steel. Ceiling maintenance and longevity. Um, so typically the types of ceilings that we're putting in buildings would be either PVC or plastic, um, aluminum, and those are the two most common and there are still some folks that put steel ceilings in um, buildings, even finishers. Um, so as far as the maintenance and, and longevity, you know, especially with power washing, you know, and particularly with PVC and aluminum, um, you know, a 3,000 pound direct blast from a power washer can damage the ceiling, um, especially at close distances. So making sure that whoever you're hiring or if you're power washing yourself, you know, clearly you need to uh, uh, hold the wand back, typically wash at an angle and, you know, if you're causing damage, lower that pressure. Um, and then do not allow the internal temperature of the barn to dip below 50 degrees is what we recommend, especially for PVC ceiling, but aluminum will also expand and contract. Um, if you let your, your barn freeze out, it can cause some damage um, just to your ceiling and not only your ceiling, but you know things like water lines and, and things like that. So. End wall maintenance, um, and this is something too that, that is probably uh, common sense, but you know, Matt was talking earlier about keeping mice away from your building. 
uh, maintaining you know the the outside of your building maybe keeping the weeds down another thing that's not a bad idea is to spray for insects a lot of the materials that are treated um, in the building packages are insect you know resistant but you know making sure that you keep as many of those things away from your barn is going to help it last longer for you um, routinely caulk around a wall fans so it's a common issue that you know, anytime a wall fan is placed into the wall anywhere, it creates an opportunity um, if it's generally caulked around for moisture to get into that wall over time. And so caulk, you know, it will fail over time. Um, making sure that you re-caulk uh, is going to be valuable and going to help your barn last longer. Uh, routine, routinely check all seams and trims, you know, just external inspection, you know, making sure that everything looks good, everything's fastened appropriately. Um, and then checking for, you know, it could be moisture issues, you know. There's, there's certain ways that, you know, buildings get built. Um, we, a lot of times, prefer a steel versus like an aluminum panel option, um, if possible and if desired by the customer. Um, so, and wall longevity, you know, using things like treated interior lumber instead of untreated. Um, that's something that's commonly done. Um, steel exterior, uh, as I discussed earlier, and then, um, you know, just vapor barriers, making sure that the trim work is appropriate and to the spec of the building and, and things like that. Um, concrete, well, facility interior, so concrete uh, top wall design, you know, making sure that that uh, things like offices maybe have concrete curb walls, you know, instead of just lumber directly mounted on the floor. Um, you know, having <clears throat> concrete in pig contact areas um, just to eliminate the opportunity for the pigs to get into that wall typically would be some type of a glass board and, and start peeling that away or working that away. Um, again, recaulking exposed plywood, um, glass board on the interior of the building. Um, inspecting hog panel and fasteners on curtain barns or curtain sidewalls just to make sure that they're not playing with that and getting that um, ripped off of the wall. Um, and then also, you know, things like electrical outlets, you know, inspecting those regularly to make sure that you're not, you know, creating some type of a, a fire hazard in your facility. Thank you very much. That's all I had. All right, thank you, Justin. Uh, with that, we'll open it up. Uh, if anybody has any questions for the panel, uh, Jamie has a box here, and if you have a question, just raise your hand, and she'll uh, she'll bring the box over to you, and you can ask the question. So, I did have one question while everybody's thinking about it for John. What do you guys think? I mean, quality quality control on slats has come a long way in the last 30 years. What do you guys think these slats, dry cast slats that we're building now are going to last in a, in a, a well-maintained environment? Well, <clears throat> there's buildings out there in that put up in the early 90s um, with uh, slats that were manufactured in the dry cast method that are still performing today. So, you know, just with the controls and the quality control we had from the early 90s, um, they're still performing. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see 20 years as being a, a short lifespan at all. So, I mean, if you maintain your slat and keep up on it, um, you know, you could, you could easily see 30 years out of a slat if you, if you treat it like it's a piece of equipment in your barn that you need to maintain and repair. Um, you know, it'll perform for a long, long time. So, you know, you could see 25 to 30 years easily on the life of a slat. Yeah, I was just wondering on repairing slats, what the temperature of that slat should be when you're trying to fix it with some concrete or whatever your, that product's called. Well, if you're going to use an epoxy product, um, you probably going to want it to be above 70 degrees. Um, regular vinyl concrete patch or Conquerite or any other specialized patch, the temperature doesn't really matter. Um, okay. Cleanliness of the slat is going to determine the performance of the patch better than the temperature. So, um, epoxy I just, I just definitely is going to be warm. too cold, maybe more than anything. Yeah, if you're going to use an epoxy degrees, product, um, their standard, the standard epoxy products that they have, 
um, need to be 70 or 80 degrees. Otherwise, they do have some specialized ones that will work in colder temperatures. So I've got a question related more to like original setup to maybe a new facility or something, not so much longevity, but what would be in like a 1200 head finisher barn, the ideal feed line setup for a, uh, a site that's going to be feed and mash feed. Uh, so gear ratio, line size, um, and auger core, what would be the recommendation? I've got stuff that's been retrofitted for years and years and I'd like to work toward a standard that flows more consistently. Does anybody have any recommendations? Take that one, Matt. Sure. Sure. So we've, uh, how, I guess where I would start with is feeder size. Um, if you have these great big, you know, 84 inch feeders and uh, or do you have smaller dry feeders? Yeah, we've, feeders got, we've got typical, most of our stuff's uh, like a 24 inch, two hole wet dry feeder. Okay, so I would probably just stay with a, a traditional model 300 type three inch type auger. You know, they've got the pellet augers out now, the 300P. I don't, you're not, you're talking about mash though, so mm -hmm. um, do, do, what's the line length in your barn? Uh, typically 190 to 220. Okay, so you have an incoming and then yep. a flag line down. Mm -hmm. um, that's very, very common. We would put like a 250 RPM motor on the incoming and a 358 on the downline. Okay. Um, one thing I, I've seen over the years with uh, installers are you should trim the anchor bearings on the incoming on, or on the, the flag line unloader. You, you should cut a little bit of that anchor bearing off because that will restrict the feed flow. And once when feed's being brought in that cycling on a motor, if you trim that anchor bearing, not the not the one outside, but the one inside, that'll help with some of that short cycling also. But a model 300 feed line, I you know I've got 350 in my own barn, um, but I've got 78 inch Crystal Springs feeders, and it takes close to an hour to fill all 10 feeders. You know when when they're all empty. And then one follow-up question, what would you typically see as your slide opening on, on a situation like that on your unloader outside of the bin? Well, during, during a, on a new auger, you don't want to open, don't open it up very far, you know, mm -hmm. a couple inches if you're doing mash and after a day or two, that uh, oil on the auger from the manufacturing process should be worn off and then you can run, you should be able to run your slide wide open, but you, you don't want to run both slides wide open. Right. Okay. And make sure the baffles are in. The, the baffles are sent with the feed systems for a reason. You know, a lot of people don't put them in and throw them, throw them off to the side, but I would, I would keep them in place as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, please give one more round of applause for our three speakers today.